Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us um, here at the Vera Institute. It's great to see a lot of familiar faces, but for those of you who haven't been here before, welcome. My name is Margaret Dezerga. I'm a project director in our Center on Sentencing and Corrections, um, and it's my pleasure to be, I guess, the host for today's Neil Weiner Research Speaker Series. Um, this series invites distinguished scholars and researchers to share their work on the justice issues that we care very much about, um, and corrections and reentry are certainly two of those major issues for us. This series began under the leadership of our former uh, research director, Neil Weiner, and following his passing, the series was named in his honor, so we're thrilled to be able to continue this. Um, for those of you who are looking ahead to your February calendars, our next speaker is Dr. Jessica Syme. She'll be speaking on February 24th on the topic of place and punishment in an era of mass incarceration, um, and she'll be sharing her research focusing on Massachusetts and particularly the Boston area. So today, um, we are joined by Dr. Ruben Miller. He's an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan, faculty affiliate at the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, and faculty associate in the Population Studies Center. He must have a really long business card to cover all of those affiliations. Um, he's been widely published in journals on criminology, human rights, law, public health, psychology, sociology, and social work. He's the co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook on Poverty in the United States and two special editions of peer-reviewed journals, one on poverty and incarceration and another on the state of black boys and men after Ferguson. He's spending this academic year at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and is currently writing a book on prisoner reentry titled Halfway Home. Um, so the way this is going to work, we're going to hear from Dr. Miller for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will open up for about 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, and we have people participating by WebEx, so welcome to those of you remote viewers. And thanks again for all of you in the room to being here. Um, and please join me in welcoming Ruben. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for coming out. Thank you. Uh, Jim for the invitation, Margaret um, uh, Lachey uh, Henderson for her uh, incredible work uh, organizing me. I tend to be disorganized. <laughs> I make sure I'm here. To my dear friend Ruth Brown, who's in the audience uh, from the Ronald McDonald House, who's just doing incredible work, continues to do incredible work as she has done for many years um, at, at, when she was at the head of the Arthur Ashe Institute, to my lovely wife, uh, and, to, and to all my new friends. You know, it's, it's, it's very good, it's very good uh, uh, to be here. And so anyway, so today's talk is, is uh, Prisoner Reentry of the Social Institution uh, and the making up of, of the ex offender. I'll make a couple of claims uh, about what reentry is and what reentry does and why we need to sort of rethink and refocus uh, on reentry itself. Uh, just to point out this picture, because Jim asked me about it, uh, this is from The Wiz. Has anyone seen The Wiz? Uh, the Wiz is not only one of my favorite movies, uh, but, uh, but this is the Tin Man. He's supposed to need a heart. He gets to the end of the road. He finds out the, the Oz is a sham. Uh, the Wizard of Oz is a sham, and he actually doesn't need a heart, right? Like, he doesn't need, nor does the lion need courage, uh, nor does the scarecrow need a brain. Uh, the whole idea of deeper human capital investment uh, in, in people who are marginalized, uh, seems to be a bit of a sham uh, as the only uh, area of, of intervention uh, that, that these folks might be thinking. Anyway, but we'll, 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 we won't come back to that, but it's a cool picture. So, so this, is, this is what my agenda is for the day. Uh, first, we're going to rethink the scale and consequence of carceral expansion. Uh, then we'll redefine and center prisoner reentry uh, in contemporary social life, thinking carefully about the work that it does. And, and what I'm trying to do here is to push the field beyond behaviorist intervention strategies, certainly beyond simply cognitive intervention strategies in the lives of people with records, uh, to address the fallout of mass incarceration. And my argument, uh, and I'll give it to you up front, and talk about my methods and these sorts of things up front. Uh, uh, my argument is that criminal justice policy has left the criminalized poor. This is largely black, poor black and Latino men, but it depends on your state. Also, like, uh, um, also Asian men, if you're in California, largely black women uh, as well, uh, and poor whites increasingly, particularly in uh, uh, 
areas of concentrated rural disadvantage and even in urban areas with concentrated white disadvantage like Columbus, Ohio, et cetera, we find that white incarceration rates also are increasing. Anyway, the poor are targeted, yeah? And so, and so criminal justice policy, our policy has left this group uh, materially and symbolically stranded. This new social arrangement has altered the urban landscape, uh, uh, transforming urban and rural social life. I focus on urbanity, so I'll talk about that quite a bit today. And, and needlessly punitive policies targeting people accused of a crime have given rise to an alternate form of citizenship. What I talk about is carceral citizenship uh, in the carceral age, and, 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 and eventually the emergence of a new kind of person. I'll make the argument the ex-offender is a new human kind. I'll talk about what that is and what that means. And so to put it quite simply, we can't CBT our way out of this. Yeah? You can't service your way. You can't social service your way out of not mass incarceration, but also mass supervision. It's community analog. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm following a, a rich black feminist tradition here, uh, which, which, which leads me to a, 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 my central concerns are with the experience, the experience of a given policy regime in a given moment in time. And so for them, it might have been slavery or Jim Crow, right? But for me, it's, it's under this new carceral age. What does the, what, how does one experience the new penal regime? I'm interested in legal, organizational, and institutional arrangements. That is how law and policy come to shape the lives of people and how they live it on the ground. I'm interested in history, uh, which I won't talk about much today, uh, but there's certainly a long uh, tradition uh, of, of, of punishment and incarceration of marginalized groups that one has to sort of think about when they're designing their interventions. Uh, think about the body. Uh, the body is particularly important. Notions of temporality, which means one's relationship with time. Uh, um, I won't talk about that much today. Identity. Uh, these, these, are, these are my central concerns and, and, and what leads me. And so, and, so, and so what I found is that the ex-offender has emerged as a salient social category, a new humankind, as it were, uh, in this carceral age. Uh, and, and, and to understand it, one has to remember a few things about it. First is that this is a situated social category. That means that, that the ex-offender lives and exists within a social context. It is not enough to change the way they think and feel, yeah? That they live within a social context. They move through a social world uh, with others. That it is sentient. That means it does, in fact, think and feel, right? And, and finally, that, that if this is the case, that it suffers. And, and, and the differential suffering, what we might call social inequality, the experience of social inequality, some groups suffer in different ways than others. Most of the time, this is needless. So just a note on social suffering. And, and I'd like to begin with a quote from my favorite social theorist, James Baldwin. He says, it comes as a great shock to discover that the country uh, to which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. You realize that you are 30 and you're having a terrible time. You've been a th through a certain kind of mill. And the most, most serious effect is, again, not the, quote, catalog of disaster, what he'll later call the, quote, bloody catalog of oppression of which we're all too familiar already. The policemen, the taxi driver, the waiters, the landlady, the banks, the insurance companies, the millions of details, 24 hours out of every day, which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. And it's not that. You are 30 by now, and nothing you have done has helped you to escape the trap. And as far as you can tell, nothing you can do will save your son or your daughter from having the same disaster and from coming to the same end. This is James Baldwin. 1965. And so I studied the mill. I wrote a paper called Baldwin's Mill that tries to examine criminal justice policies and the ways in which it grinds <laughs> on the lives of the, of the criminalized poor. This is a list of some of my publications um, on similar and related topics. Um, but and my questions, my questions are about how one experiences this mill. So in this case, I'll talk about how one experiences reentry. And, and, and what work that experience does in their day-to-day -day lives. When one asks these questions and one begins from the place of experience, they begin to ask the question of the broader implications of individual experiences. And once we've grasped these broader implications, I wonder how might we approach reentry policy and practices given what we've learned. So this is the, the, the format for the talk. My research was collected over about five years. Um, I spent three and a half years doing ethnography in halfway houses in Chicago. 
I am following folks around who moved from halfway house to halfway house. And I also spent about a year and a half doing observations and qualitative interviews um, with about 90 folks who were released from prisons, uh, jails, and detention centers in Detroit, Ypsilanti, and now uh, in New York City, where I'm following around a group of formerly incarcerated activists. Now, the limitations to being an ethnographer, I'm an ethnographer, it's, just, it's, my, it's, it's, it's how I do my work, um, that we can certainly talk about uh, uh, as you'd like. I'd like to just summarize the two. One is the small sample size, what can you learn from that? And the second uh, has to do with what it means to use one's body as, as, a, as, as sort of a, uh, uh, as, as, as an instrument of, of data collection uh, and to use that in, in one's analysis. And, um, and my argument would be that uh, uh, there's a difference between what people say and what they do. And, 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 so, and, so, and so surveys capture some things and interviews capture others. Uh, but seeing, directly seeing how people interact with different uh, uh, social structures, different people, different institutions in their lives. They, they often tell a very different story. The, the, the story that I tell to defend this is, um, uh, folks, I'm, I was a religious guy. I started this work uh, as a volunteer chaplain. And so, and so if you ask me, hey, Reuben, how often do you go to church? I would say, well, somebody asked me, would you please ask me? I'll say once a week, right? I'll say once a week. I go to church once a week. Uh, but the truth is, is that I go to church once a week when my wife is in town. <laughs> right? So, so when she when she travels, so do I. Anyway, so I, so I, don't, I don't quite make it to church anyway. But that's not, that's, not the, that's not the point. But there's a difference between what people say and what they do. And and we can have a conversation about one's position in the field. Um, the, the main argument here is that me being a black male doesn't automatically grant me entrance or a particular kind of knowledge of the experiences of black people because blackness is complicated, right? Like it's it's not it's not one. It's not one black experience, as there's not one Asian experience, as there's not one way to be poor in the United States. And so I had to do a kind of work to gain access and to understand what I was looking at. We can talk about that if you're interested. And so why prison reentry? And the reason for this is simple. This is because reentry occurs across multiple sites, and it involves multiple actors, though these sites and actors are largely unaccounted for in the, in the literature. And reentry has transformed the social landscape, right, and with it, urban sociality, giving rise to new social forms, which I'll talk about. And finally, it's because prisons and police honestly get all the action, right? And most of the research is on the prison. Most of the focus is on the police. This is for good reasons. Um, but what we have to do is we have to rethink the scope, range, and consequence of carceral expansion. We have to deconstruct our intervention strategy. We have to re uh, and reimagine the target population itself if we're to get anywhere in our efforts to address uh, mass incarceration. And so we'll begin with the first takeaway, the rethinking of the scope and consequence of the problem. And I'd like to begin this section by saying that we indeed live in strange and marvelous times, yeah? Strange and marvelous. Uh, 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 the prison has returned to the public view in a way that was largely unanticipated a decade ago. Right, and this is due to a number of reasons. I have Michelle Alexander's best-selling book up here uh, because it helped a whole lot in, 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 the, in helping the public to, to move to a place of thinking about the problem of, of, of mass incarceration, as has the work of Vera, uh, of Vera, as have popular accounts of the prison and prison life. I mean, this is Piper Kerman and her group, her, her, her group of friends uh, as, they, as they traverse uh, the, the federal prisons and eventually a halfway house. I understand I haven't gotten that far in the seasons. Um, uh, and even the last sitting president um, uh, began to think about prisons, coming out against uh, the casual use of, for example, prison rape jokes. Uh, um, uh, uh, uh. But the prison has also provided us with moments of sobriety and deep introspection. This, of course, is a life-size bust of Michael Brown's body that was on display in Chicago uh, in, in, in 2014. Uh, and as a result, as I mentioned, of all of this, policing and incarceration got the lion's share of scholarly attention, and this is with good reason. I mean, who could forget the summer that the, 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 the summers where, where, where cities across the country burned uh, in revolt to 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 uh, uh, police brutality, to to activism that was happening in the streets? Uh, who can forget these moments? Uh, and of course, this is the world's most famous graph. Yeah, this is this is the the U.S. prison population, uh, and we see the, the steep. Uh, incline over time. The prison even made it to the Oscars. This is Soul Crooner John Legend, right, <laughs> who, 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 who says that we live in the most incarcerated nation in the world and goes on to quote Michelle Alexander at his Grammy Award acceptance speech. And even the president comes out against mass incarceration using that language, right, and speaking out actively against it to the point where he visits a prison, the first sitting president to do that. Um, anyway, we can all lament now inside. 
Uh, okay, we'll move forward. We'll call it together. Even, even Sesame Street, right? Sesame Street is thinking about mass incarceration, which tells us something about its ubiquity. But what remains hidden is a curious and equally historic and overlooked phenomena that, that's hidden in plain sight. This is the rise of a supervised society. And to capture it, we have to put the prison in its place. So right now, uh, it's somewhere around 2.1, 2.2 million prisons. I understand that the latest numbers show a, a decline of a couple hundred thousand people. That's fantastic uh, uh, and, and something that should be appreciated. Um, so over 2 million prisons, still a whole lot, still the world leaders and all that, but, but one should appreciate how many folks are in prisons. There's a whole lot of folks in prisons. But if we compare that to the number of people on probation or parole, as many folks in this room already know, uh, that that number is more than doubled. If you switch your unit of analysis to think about the number of people who are processed through a county jail in a given year, and, and it's, it's over 3,000 county jails, we know that 11.8 million people are annually processed through these spaces, 11.8 million people who are moving in and out, in and out, right, uh, uh, which is its own consideration and its own caution, uh, and Vera reminds us that we have to think about jails. Uh, but if we look at the number of folks with felony convictions, a report came out in 2010 that, that estimated the number of folks uh, who are currently living with a felony conviction or who are currently living with a felony conviction, 19.8 million people, a third of whom were black, which equates to about a third of all black men having a felony conviction. This is so much larger than the prison. These are all folks who live in community. And of course, criminal records. Uh, I think it's registry number three or something like that, uh, the, the Bureau of Justice Statistics report that came out in 2014 using 2012 data that shows that something like 79 million Americans trying to make sure that they don't double count have a felony, have a felony record. This is a third of all U.S. adults. This is incredible. So the point here is not that the prison is unimportant. It's just that it's a relatively small slice of a vast carceral network. And so we have to rethink the revolving door to account for these many different institutions that manage criminalized populations, from probation officers, parole officers, jailers, but others too, which I'll get to in a second. If we think about the Bureau of Justice Statistics report that came out in 2014, the largest recidivism study, most comprehensive recidivism study to date, tracked uh, uh, released inmates uh, across 30 states, 400,000 found a 77% recidivism rate after five years. Uh, so the, uh, the idea is that they are re-arrested. There's sort of a churning here. But something I, I want to uh, focus our attention to was that 44% of that population of the recidivists, right, 44% of the recidivists had been back to, had been arrested 10 times or more. So let that sink in for a hot second. 10 times or more arrests. How does one hold a job? How does one connect with their family in a meaningful way? Yeah. How do they participate in the civic uh, institutions of their given community in ways that might, say, transform policies that lead to their arrest? How does one push back against hotspot policing or million-dollar blocks at the end of New York City? So the geography of reentry is also telling. I'll show that in a second. But first, we have to account for the pervasive and cyclical nature of arrest, confinement, release, and reentry. This has become a normal social arrangement in the lives of the urban poor. But what does this look like and how is it experienced? Well, this is the National Inventory of Collateral Consequences of Conviction. This is uh, curated by the American Bar Association. This was a tremendous public service that they did, counting across states how many laws, regulations, and administrative sanctions folks with criminal records uh, are under in a given state. The total number is over 48,000. Over 48,000. But all politics are local. In the state of Michigan, where I do my research, there's 789 laws in the state of Michigan right, that, 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 that restrict formerly incarcerated people from accessing employment, uh, housing acquisition, political and civic engagement, doing things like adoption. What does that look like? 350 laws that target employment, just employment, 350. 301 that limit the acquisition of business licenses and property rights. In other words, I can't get that license to be an entrepreneur, right? 
120 that limit political and civic participation, that limits which boards I can sit on, which nonprofit organizations I can participate in. In other words, my political participation is limited beyond just the franchise. 45 laws that limit access to housing, the, the wonderful work that's happening here, the NYCHA pilot and others across the nation, um, the evaluations that are happening of those uh, uh, attest to the need for this. But 45 laws in one state, uh, that limit whether or not one can live in public housing, who, can they, who they can be in, 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 in a place with. Well, I'm from Chicago. Uh, Illinois is no different. 1,463 unique laws, administrative sanctions, and regulations that bar their access to things, which include 583 that limit acquisition of business licenses and property. Again, modes of entrepreneurship, modes of ownership. 556 that target employment. Right? 186 that limit political and civic participation, 54 that constrain family and domestic rights. When can you see your kids, how you can see them, whether or not you can increase your family size through adoption. 21 that limit access to housing, one state. New York's no exception, 1,300 unique laws. 555 for that business licenses and property, 606 to target employment, 147 on political participation, 61, constraining family and domestic rights, 35 that limit access to housing. This is where we live. The criminal record is so far beyond work. It's so, I'll talk about this. I'll talk about this. Can't get ahead of myself. But community is where the action is, yeah? It's where the action is. We have to think about where this is concentrated. This is a map of Chicago from the very famous uh, uh, returning home study and uh, returning home in Illinois, prison reentry in Illinois from 2003. And it shows that, that over half of all prisoners who are released in the state of Illinois return uh, to the city of Chicago. So there are 40, there's about 35,000 prisoners that are released each year in the state of Illinois. And 17 and a half thousand of those folks return to the city of Chicago. Half of them, over half, 54%, somewhere around 9,000, return to just six neighborhoods out of 77 Chicago community areas. But it's not just the, the prisoners who return here. This is also where we concentrate our best interventions to help them. Prisoner reentry programs are overwhelmingly concentrated in these neighborhoods. Now, one might say, I'm scratching an itch by placing my reentry service in the neighborhoods that most need them. One might also ask, what does it mean to do substance abuse treatment three doors down from a crack house? One might also ask, what does it mean to be arrested from, returned to, and rehabilitated all within a few blocks of your house? Or better yet, a house that's like your house. Because formerly incarcerated people are highly transient, having to move three and four times a year. Right? What does it mean to be, for, for this level of concentration? I think there's an argument about social containment that we have to think about and think through carefully. Guys that I studied, guys that I followed, had never been to the lake if they lived on the west side, or had never been to the south side if they, if they lived north. Right? There's, there's something about that that's perverse that we, have to, that we have to think carefully about. And if there's any question about the race, class, uh, 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 dynamics of this, um, we see uh, from this little handy chart from a publication that I put out in 2014 uh, that, 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 that four out of these six neighborhoods were 90% black and the other two were 90% black and Latino. Right? The geography of reentry is striking, startling. All this disadvantage concentrated in these tiny spaces. It's not just arrest and incarceration. It's what is life like when you get out, right? Detroit's quite similar. It's designated high risk because of its degree of disadvantage. Uh, it's residents, 82.7% of whom were black in 2014, uh, are 7% of Michigan's population, but furnished 27% of its prisoners, the vast majority of whom returning uh, to just eight zip codes, all within Detroit city limits. And of course, there's million dollar blocks that, that, that folks in New York are, are all well aware of. So what does this all mean? This means that prisoner reentry is not an event that happens in the lives of folks. 
like, okay, the, the, the definition of reentry is fantastic. It helps us in a nonpartisan way to think about meeting the service needs of folks, right? And, and it's apolitical, right? It's, it's often defined by criminologists, leading criminologists, as an event that almost all prisoners undergo. But it's not just a, an event, and it's not apolitical. There's power relationships rife within it that we have to consider, especially when we're designing services to address these, the massive amount of need that's associated with it. So given the number of people who cycle between prison and some poor urban community, prison arrangements become a normative social arrangement. I mean that in two ways. One, as in a normal process process that people, right, most people can come to expect. You can expect to be arrested, you can expect to return, and you can expect to have multiple rounds of reentry going back and forth between prisons, jails, detention centers, police station lockup facilities, anywhere from a few hours to a few days to a few years to many years. This is a normal expectation. Right? There's normal expectation that's racially stratified. Uh, the, the Hetty Lee and colleagues uh, 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 published a study in 2015 uh, that, that studied the connectedness of, of, of uh, racial inequalities and the connectedness uh, uh, of, of folks to prisoners. So what they followed, what they, what they studied was the extent to which someone uh, who was reporting on the General Social Survey had a prisoner in their family. I believe Hetty Lee is coming or came already. Um, her work's very important. I don't know her, but she's fantastic. Everybody should read her. Uh, right. But but so but so but so uh, and what she found was that 44 percent of black women had a currently incarcerated family member. Forty four percent. But one in eight white women had a currently incarcerated family member. Think about this for two seconds. The disparity is incredible. That's terrible. It's awful. It's egregious. It's the worst in the world. Right. Like that's terrible. Nobody should. We shouldn't suffer that. Why, why do we suffer these things? Why do we put up with it? We should be in the streets revolting now. Everybody get up. Right? <laughs> right? No, we should be. It's awful. But what does it mean for one in eight white women to have a currently incarcerated family member? This is incredible. It is a pervasive and cyclical uh, uh, social arrangement that alters social life in ways that we haven't yet well accounted for. Like the family, the labor market, and education, arrest, incarceration, and successive rounds of prisoner reentry are normal social processes for poor people. It's also normative. There's a, a kind of moral economy that's associated with this, which I can talk about, um, uh, I write about this in some ways, but we can talk about this uh, if you'd like. But th there's a kind of moral work that people have to do to prove that they're good people, and we will talk about that in a hot second. People with records have to prove that they're, quote, good people. And then prisoner reentry has emerged, therefore, as a national policy priority in the prisoner reentry program, a key if under or analyzed organizational form. But even our best interventions fail to address the problem, and this, 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 this is for a, a simple reason. There's a deep and largely unaccounted for kind of vulnerability that people with criminal records face that other people just don't. And so, and so this is largely because of the social condition that they find themselves in, the social position, rather, that they find themselves in. So, so if I can't get a job, Right. And I can't participate in government. Right. I can't participate in civic institutions. I can't start a business uh, because of the, the 100 million regulations, many of which I, don't, I can't know. Right. I, I can't know if I go from one state to another I'm actually in violation of a law because there are a thousand here and 987 there. Right. Because of this, I become vulnerable to the goodwill of others, employers, Landlords, criminal justice actors and agencies, licensing bodies and government officials, families and social service providers have unaccounted for power, inordinate amounts of power in the lives of formerly incarcerated people. This is because I have to depend on folks. I have to depend on folks to help me. I can't get a job. I need a couch to sleep on. All right, we'll talk about that in a second. This shifting power dynamic has fundamentally altered social relationships. Not just the legal status of folks, right? Citizenship is more than a legal status. I'll make this argument in a second, right? But citizenship is also an experience. All right, we'll talk about this. The new catalog of disaster would be these many laws, regulations, uh, and administrative sanctions that, that folks experience that alter uh, social interaction. It renders every act of kindness from any one of these actors as a kind of favor. This is because they have to go above and beyond the call of duty to provide it. This is because there's stakes. So the ex-offender has to put everyone else they encounter at ease. Every interaction, it's not, you know, there may be formerly incarcerated people here, and this might, I think this, I think this captures the experience. I think it does, because I've talked to a million five people. But, 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 but the interactions go like this. I was a terrible person. I was the worst of the worst. 
but I've made good now. I volunteer in my community. I help wayward children. I put my body on the line as a violence interrupter or something like that. Look, I'm a good guy, right? Why don't you, why don't you rent an apartment to me? What does any of that have to do with renting a place or extending employment? Why does a formerly incarcerated person have to undergo this performative work, this emotional work, and this convincing of the other that they're, in fact, good? It's not just in the informal. It happens formally, too, through how we structure our reentry programs. We'll talk about that in a hot second. But this is not the same thing, I would argue, a stereotype threat, which is which there's a big literature on this. Stereotype threat uh, is, is, is a, it suggests that, um, say, I'm a black man. As a black man, uh, I bear the burden of convincing others that I'm not a bad person because badness is associated with my blackness. So I'm not bad at math. I'm not, you know, I'm not criminal or something like that. The, 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 the book that, that, that's highlighted here is this book, Whistling Vivaldi by Claude Steele. It's a brilliant book. And so, and so the anecdote comes from uh, a, a black uh, college student or something like that who's walking down the street, and he's, he's thinking that, that, that others are afraid of him. See, this is, this is the kind of psychological weight that, that, that race plays. And so to allay that fear, the fear in the other, he begins whistling Vivaldi, right? And, and this is how he gets over this fear, this, right? It's, and, so, and so this burden, this, this bears weight, and it causes neg it's got negative health implications and all that stuff, right? But the prisoner can't, the formerly incarcerated person can't whistle Vivaldi. They've got a criminal conviction, right? I, I have my blackness. I don't have a criminal conviction. You can't legally exclude me from things. I can sue you, right? I can get together as a group, as a class, and sue. But I can't get together as a class of felons. There's an association clause in everyone's conditions of release when they walk out the door. So it's not stereotype threat, it's something else. Third parties have incredible leverage in their lives and interactions now have life or death consequences. Why do I say this? This is because helping puts others at risk. So it's not that families, employers, licensing bodies, and landlords are bad people. That's not the point at all. The point is there's a kind of weight that's on them as well because mass incarceration or mass supervision, I think more accurately, uh, as, a more, as, a, as a more accurate description, of, brings a lot of folks into the gambit here. Employers, landlords, licensing bodies become arms of the state responsible for the care and punishment of formerly incarcerated people because of the interpretation of liability law if you're an employer or if you're a landlord. So, so a family may face eviction if they house a formerly incarcerated person. So you have to make sure that you're worth the, the, the risk. There's also fatigue of parents, partners, and children who have to indefinitely provide support for people who are excluded by law from the labor market or many aspects of it. And finally, employers, landlords, and social service agencies are made responsible for the, quote, ex-offender because of interpretations of liability law. So they can be sued. If you're a social service provider, you can be shut down. If you're, if you're, if you're, so you end up creaming, right? There's pressure from all sides here. But, 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 but the consequences are even higher for the formerly incarcerated person. This is because they are made at once dependent on others through processes of formal legal exclusion, but they're also rendered undesirable uh, candidates for help. This is a largely unaccounted for vulnerability that is nowhere in the research literature. An argument with my partner, if I have a record, could equal about the street homelessness for me, right? A problem with a coworker could equal a loss of, 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 scarce, of a scarce work opportunity because I'm hanging on to the employment by the skin of my teeth, right? Uh, a missed opportunity or pissing hot when I show up to my parole office and pissing hot could be anything from weed, which is now legal in a gang of states, right? To, to, to having a drink, uh, something that is formally legal is now made illegal for me, right? This could be a trip back to prison, or at least if, if I'm in the state of Michigan, I might get, quote, laid down for 30 days at the, quote, eyedrop facility, a detention center that houses, quote, parole violators for 30 days if they violate their parole, but they don't want to spend the money and send them back to prison. A misunderstanding with a case manager. This could equal loss of a job, food, transportation, drug treatment, counseling, or family reunification. There's so much at stake. These are life or death consequences. So with this being the case, right, this is the case that I've laid out for you. This is a fundamentally unique social arrangement. It is different for formerly incarcerated people than it is for any other group, even any other marginalized group. This is because every other marginalized group, black people, welfare mothers, 
uh, uh, Latinos who are not documented, right? Undocumented immigrants have their own set of uh, issues that, that we have to think carefully about. Uh, but they don't have 48,000 laws written against them. This is a unique social position, a unique thing that we have made, right? So because of that, we have to change how we approach intervening in their lives. Does this make sense? So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to bring you into the life. I'm an ethnographer. Yeah, I, I tell stories. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you a couple stories um, about the lives of a couple people um, who, who I followed uh, over the course of, of, of these five years. And I'd like to first begin uh, in, in, in the maximum security wing of the Cook County Jail, where I did work initially as a volunteer. The gray steel door closed behind me. The guard in all, plex in all plexiglass observation room buzzed me into the gray steel cell doors to separate me from the men, some sitting on stainless steel tables playing cards, other in front of their doors, leaning one foot on the deep brown cement floors and one on the sallowy white cinder block that's behind me or behind them. I give the call for chapel. I was a religious volunteer when I started this work. The men, they walked over to greet me. At the time, I was a youngish, late 20s religious volunteer. Some came in groups, others in twos and threes. Uh, we chatted about a number of things, their court cases, their family, the art that they would uh, sort of produce. Uh, one guy liked to draw Care Bears for whatever reason. Uh, world affairs, uh, what they'd been reading. We held hands, stood in a circle as was our custom and prayed for the service, our families, and for God to, quote, use us. Um, one twenty-something inmate asked if he could sing a song, and I obliged. He left the circle, stood his back to the cell door. With one foot on the floor, he pounded the other against the cell door to keep the beat. The men, they clapped on the offbeat. And then most of them began to sing a song that I will not sing. Uh, but, but the words go, you can't worry, my God. No, no, no. You just have to wait. You've been waiting so long. But no matter how long it takes, he's a God. You just can't hurry. Hurry. He'll be there. Don't you worry. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Learning to wait will come in handy for these folks, right? Uh, whether it was for the 10 months that it took for the dope dealer Lorenzo Robb to come to court and testify against him, he eventually did eight years, or for Philip to get some appointment with his public defender, which took weeks. Uh, he was facing a 77-year sentence for a murder of a, of a pregnant ex-girlfriend, potentially the, the, his own child in the shooting of a boyfriend. But this waiting extended far beyond the jail itself, where I first heard about the need for patience in the lives of these folks. Even if you got out, which seemed like it would never happen, though it does in 90% in of the cases, this waiting would continue and continue on the outside. I first met Jimmy Johnson, a short, affable, pudgy African-American man in his late 50s, on the day that he was released from a mandated drug treatment program in Detroit. We met at a bus depot in Detroit in six degree weather. He had traveled an hour to meet me, glad to participate in the interview session for the $40 gift card that I would give him at the end. He was poor. He had dual diagnosis, drug addiction and bipolar disorder from a community mental health program uh, uh, from right before he started an eight year bit uh, for a drug and property related crime. When he got to prison, the Michigan Department of Corrections clinical staff, likely a mental health worker, told him he didn't have a mental health problem. He had a drug problem. So they took him off his medication. He spent the next eight years with no pharmaceutical treatment for his bipolar disorder. But he was an agreeable uh, and generally upbeat man, so no one seemed to notice. This is until a, pro a perceptive probation officer told him, once he was released, you got an issue. He was ordered to report to community mental health, a different clinic from the first, which had since closed. It's Detroit, after all. After an intake interview and a psychological assessment, they reconfirmed that he did indeed have bipolar disorder and put him back on the medication that it was, he was off for eight years. For our meeting, I would follow him for, to the first mandatory visit to a community mental health clinic for outpatient counseling services, and then to workforce, a workforce development agency that was contracted by the city. We walked a mile from the bus depot in the dead of winter, likely the coldest day of the year to that point. He was underdressed in a hat, a thin baseball-like black jacket, no gloves, or a scarf. While I was grateful to learn about his life, I was cold, and so was he. We made our way to the building, a high-rise monstrosity with no visible light in the windows from the outside. The building, of course, was closed. Not, like, we're not open, closed. Not the service, the entire building. The closest family social service center was nine miles away. 
There was no phone number on the sign for him to call, and he ran out of minutes on his cell phone, even if there was one. He would have had to walk to, back to the bus depot and use Detroit's notoriously unpredictable bus service to try to make his destination. I decided to give him a ride. This is a violation of scientific protocol or something like that, uh, but I was cold. <laughs> but without me, he would have neither had bus fare uh, uh, with the $40 that I was going to give him after we completed the day, right? Like we're following him around, we're going to do the interview. If, but I had to violate scientific protocol to give him the bus car anyway. Uh, uh, and he would, have had to, he would have either had to have walked the nine miles or missed the appointment altogether for what he interpreted as a mandate from a parole officer to attend, risking his re-imprisonment. This combination of precarity and derision, right? On the one hand, he is precariously attached to the labor market, right? And also to any sort of social service scene that would be able to buffer uh, the effects of this. But it amplifies the stakes of every interaction. Formerly incarcerated people must therefore engage with members of the public in such a way that they are put at ease. He had to put me at ease so that I felt safe enough for him to get, for example, in my car, right? That I felt safe enough to violate scientific protocol and hand him a bus card, right? That I felt safe enough uh, to, to, to even meet with him and, and undergo this ordeal, not walking with him uh, the, the nine miles or so. To elicit support from others, they have to convince the other that they have changed their life, meaning that they take responsibility for their presumed actions in the social, in the social situations they face. That is, formerly incarcerated people must demonstrate that they have become good, that they are worth, worth the risk associated with helping them. So he spent an inordinate amount of time trying to convince me that, of how he had changed his life, what kind of bad person he was, this sort of thing. These are not even questions that I asked, right? These, these are things that he volunteered uh, to me. Uh, this new social arrangement has transformed the urban landscape and, ur and altered inner city sociality. During the course of my field work, former prisons would demonstrate their expertise by, quote, giving back to a perceived community of similarly stigmatized people. They would visit schools and lecture at-risk youth, volunteer soup kitchens and social service agencies that help the poor, the sick, and the, and the insecurely housed. And most often, they provide mentorship to other formerly incarcerated people. At the same time, the reliance of the state on community-based actors, right, the reliance of the state on people like me, individual actors, to provide services, and they rely on me because they don't provide them, right, and relying on me and outsourcing the responsibility to make sure that the person is reintegrated into their community uh, 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 is emblematic of larger processes of devolution, where the responsibility to integrate the formerly incarcerated into the organs of the economy, civil society and culture is offloaded onto the, their families and third-party actors that operate in poor spaces. In giving back, the ex offender expresses a kind of masculinity that is self-referential and caring. I'll talk about this in a hot minute. Um, this is not the same thing as a kind of street masculinity believed to eschew vulnerability and valorize independence. I'll talk about this in a hot second. But again, this is not stereotype drag. This is something else. Reentry. So, 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 so this is his experience when he walks out of the jail. And informally, he's dependent on me, so he's trying to convince me to, to, to provide care for him. But I'd like to talk for a hot second about how reentry programs operate uh, and how they are themselves a response to a presumed street culture, a presumed set of uh, deficiencies, uh, uh, that, how, they, how they respond to the ways in which they, they construct the target population. We'll talk about uh, the reentry service model itself and the human capital investment strategy that it employs that teaches people not just to reframe their, their social search situations and conditions, but it tries to uh, 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 provide within them uh, social skills uh, 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 and, 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 and what folks talk about is soft skills like tenacity, trustworthiness, and grit. Uh, there's a best-selling book called Grit. <laughs> it's all about the soft skills that people need that are supposed to be, that are supposed to help them on the labor market, this sort of thing. The Reentry program operates on this human capital rationale in its intervention strategies. It provides one of a few kinds of programming, largely around social skills training, sometimes referred to as life skills. This ranges from anything from anger management uh, uh, to, to, to life skills will be like how to balance a checkbook. Uh, uh, they do employment readiness training uh, in many reentry programs, and of course, CBT programs, uh, the titles of which are things like criminal thinking, thinking for a change, moral recognition therapy, drug treatment, which is usually based on a CBT or AA model, et cetera. I'm, I'm noticing I'm getting a little close. So, so <laughs> what I'd like to do is I'd like to wrap, but I'd like to wrap um, 
with the point. The, the larger point here is that these ideas, the, the formerly incarcerated people begin to embody these ideas that they must prove that they're good people. And this happens both in the reentry service model, which focuses on this, which says you must be tenacious, you must be hardworking, you must prove to others that you're a good person, and you must give back. Uh, but it's not just uh, that, that this is just a cultural expression. There's an entire political economy that begins within uh, reentry organizations, for example, and extends beyond them. People who show that they're good people get connected to jobs. They could get connected to, to uh, work in, in the social service agency, one of few uh, open uh, fields uh, for them to operate in, right? Uh, uh, they, they, get, they get referrals to other uh, social service agencies, et cetera. We're almost there. I'm done. The larger argument here is that the unique laws, regulations, and social practices that extend both from the formal side of things to the informal side of things, the unique responsibilities and expectations, in this case, the responsibility and expectation that they would show that they're good, the unique set of interactions with others that this engenders, and the unique institutions that manage them has created a kind of rights gap uh, for the formerly incarcerated. Our policies have made up a new kind of person altogether and with them a new kind of citizenship that they have to learn to embody uh, and employ. In sum, we've made this, and we can't CBT our way out of mass incarceration. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Um, so we're gonna take about 10 to 12 minutes for questions. And we have mics in the room. It's not, so, it's not to project in the room. It's really for people listening remotely. So if you could raise your hand, wait to get a mic um, before you ask your question, that would be great. Who would like to go first? Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm also from Chicago, and uh, I'm working in a reentry program on the um, south side of Chicago, actually, the Woodlawn community, which is the host community for the Obama Presidential Library. Uh, but you said a couple of things that I wanted to, um, to look at. One is uh, you talked about communities and the service delivery on the side of nonprofits. Uh, when you look at the resources for reentry, most of those resources are at the level of corrections courts and not really at the level of communities. The other issue is that communities have assets that are untapped. So that's sort of the, the, the ma and pa grocery store kind of a model. So they're, they're, they're mothers who are putting together bake sales to do something on the block. So that we look at reentry from the prison side or we look at uh, prisons and higher education, we look at that whole issue of, of colleges having to work with communities, that is sort of where the gap is at because um, that, uh, uh, that issue of linking with communities, but linking with their, their assets that we need to tap in those communities versus coming in to say, well, this is how we're going to do this and this is how we want you to do this. So the top-down uh, approach to service delivery is going to backfire. And, of, of course, when it backfires, we look at the community as sort of uh, the flaw yeah. in that, that whole process. So I just wanted you to speak to how we might be able to, to uh, uh, address the issue of under services and, and being under-resourced in communities for nonprofit organizations. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, there are a couple things that 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 um, one. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and so, and so, reentry programs are under resourced. It's, it just is the case. Um, and even if some reentry programs are well resourced, they simply don't. There's not enough organizational capacity to meet the needs of 79 million people who are excluded by law from the labor market from civic life, and even that reaches within families, both formally and informally, right? The, the reentry program, there is no program to help 
uh, 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 formerly incarcerated folks. Well, I mean, there are, uh, but there are far fewer. There are there there are far than enough interventions that help families, for example, cope with the strain of caring for somebody who is who is who is basically banished from the labor market. That's a whole thing. There's a whole set of needs there. And so and so some of the things uh, that I've found to be successful is to is is, is when programs um, move away from a behaviorist um, model and begin to embrace models that connect resource poor folks with resource rich social institutions. And so I'll, I'm going to take 22 seconds to, to, to finish this uh, uh, comment. So, so, so for example, formerly incarcerated people are excluded from the labor market because employers are allowed to discriminate against them. The reentry programs that have shown the most success have been programs that go before the formerly incarcerated person and say, I've got 10 guys and they're good. You know, they, they engage in the same behavior that I think is highly problematic, which is, which is you know, this, this sort of moral work that's happening here. It's highly problematic, um, but one must do it in the, in the state and time that we live in. And they go, they say, hey, I got 10 guys that are great. Will you hire them? They say, based on my relationship with you, yes. When those folks get hired, they stay out of prison or jail. They stay out of trouble. They're able to, 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 to contribute to their families, et cetera. And so when the material need is met, and it can only be met through a bridge, not through tenacity, grit, uh, constantly trying. If you do, if tenacity and grit is going to get you 500 notes, right? Uh, uh, but a bridge, someone who, who's willing to put their name out for you, gets you connected. This is a, a, a social capital intervention instead of a human capital intervention. Does this make sense? And so, and, so, and so I've seen this kind of bridge work work. I've seen it work in, 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 in both labor market interventions where people connect people to employers or the job developers. We see it in housing, for example, the pilot programs where they say we'll take in, uh, uh, we'll allow people who have records to live with their families. These folks tend to do better. Uh, the, the, the folks who are not allowed to, for example, live in public housing, et cetera. And so, and so, and so, and so one has to, has, to, has to go before the group and connect them. That, that's, that's one way that I think would be most helpful. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the performative aspect of being a good person. Yeah. Um, specifically, is there a social cost or a psychic cost associated with that? Um, has that been flagged in your research by your participants in your ethnography, et cetera? Yeah, so the research on stereotypes that bears this out, you know, in interesting ways. I mean, it, um, it, it, it's stress uh, to have to constantly prove that you're, you're, you're not a bad person. Uh, it, 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 it diminishes, for example, performance in uh, school performance. And so, and so, and so there's, there's been a, a number of studies that show um, um, uh, when a trigger to stereotype threat is evident. So if a, if a, if a, if if I phrase um, uh, a question like if I say, you know, we all know that women do poorly in math. Go do these ten tasks. That the, that the women who do the task do worse uh, uh, than and 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 when men take that same test and they say we know women do poorly in math and I do these tasks because they don't bear that weight. They tend to do better. They they tend to do better on the task themselves. And so and so and so there's, there's a weight on on on. There's like a cognitive load. Uh, that, 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 that we see here. But the other thing is, is uh, th th what I tend to see is just sheer exhaustion. And so, and so, and so, and so you've got a, <laughs> um, uh, uh, exhaustion on, on, on the, 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 from the perspective of the formerly incarcerated person. My guys say things like, I feel like I'm in a zoo. Right? Uh, I'm tired of people looking at me. I'm tired of people paying care. Right? This, this idea that, that you feel, and then add mental health issues to this. Add a diagnosis from some sort. And then you treat it like you're paranoid. No, no, no. There's actually 48,000 laws paying attention. Uh, right? They're actually active. You actually do have to report to 95 people. And there are people who are looking and watching other things that you do. So anyway, there, there are a number of, of repercussions. You've talked about how a lot of different forces impact identity and how a lot of reentry programs uh, kind of reinforce a uh, stereotype and an I a particular identity. Have you looked into or have opinion on how other things like, for example, the funding of those reentry programs Absolutely. Uh, kind of determine the type of programs and, and services they can provide and why that funding might be constructed that way? Absolutely. So, yes. <laughs> uh, the, the, so if, if one looks at, for example, 
foundations and the kinds of things that foundations are looking to fund, um, we see the kinds of services that programs tend to provide, right? The state, when, when state offers a set of funding, for, so, so if we look inside the text of the Second Chance Act, what was in there? And not that we want Second Chance money expanded, all of that, right? But what was in there? Mentorship programs, uh, uh, these, these sort of CBT-based uh, programs, family planning, right, uh, uh, leadership development. So, so there are all these ideas that are based on assumptions of the individuals that they're serving. And what happens in the case is that, is that the funding is targeted, the, the policies and the funding are written in such a way that they reflect how they feel or, or, or the, 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 the construction of this group, which is why, and I appreciate this question very much, I'm trying to push us to rethink this whole paradigm. What if we viewed formerly incarcerated people like everybody else? What thing would anybody else need? Like, what would be, everybody else needs a job, a house, right? Material stuff. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm not controlling this. I should. <laughs> uh, one of the things we, uh, I, I run an organization called Refoundry, and one of the things we look at is a lot of the, you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, most of the workforce development is funded by the federal government that requires six to eight weeks of training before job placement. You get six to eight weeks of training. What kind of job you going to get, and what, and and more importantly, the job you do get, these are jobs that employers really don't invest in, and so that kind of reinforces the cycle. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, you 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 spoke about men in, who are coming out of the system. Is is there anything about uh, women coming out of the system that's distinctive? My guess would be that they're even more vulnerable to these therapeutic interventions. Uh, uh, that's absolutely the case. I mean, there's a robust literature on, on what people talk about as therapeutic governance, for example. Um, and, and the gender responsive treatments tend to emphasize things like caring. Uh, uh, you go into an organization and they'll have up like pink walls. I mean, so there's all this, right, there's all this, this, this constructions of particular kinds of people in, in, a, in a given moment in time. And the reason why the theoretical point is so important is because how we imagine the target of the intervention shapes how we intervene in their lives. So no, you, you, you're absol that's absolutely the case. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great presentation. Um, I want to say is this: um, the people that's actually going to prison was actually put there as being bad people, right? And the prison actually has the notion that they're a reformatory school. So how did these individuals be released back into society as bad people when they was actually extracted to be bad people to actually be turned into good people? How do they actually come back and say, "I have to prove again I'm not a bad person as I came to a reformatory school"? Yeah, it's, it, I, I think this is a, a, a fantastic question and, and a point, right? Like the, the contradiction here, the idea that I'm taking um, people from a situation, labeling them bad, putting them in a position that's worse, and then expecting them to act in a particular kind of way when they return, as if they didn't just go through prison and prison life with limited access to services, limited help, et cetera. It's a beautiful question. It's, it's the perfect question. And this has everything to do, I think, with the way in which we conceptualize the people that we're following. And so because of racism, class bias, gender discrimination, all these big things matter in very important ways because they show up in the ways in which we construct the target of the intervention. In other words, the person who's writing the policy, and I'm not trying to find a big bad policymaker, that, that's not the point, but, but someone who wrote one of these 48,000 policies thought that it was a good idea to protect a family from their father, right? Why do I think that? Let's get away from that. that, 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 that that's precisely uh, the point. Thank you for that question. So we're going to make this the last one. Um, you kind of like just rushed past this, and I loved everything and scribbling madly, but um, when you talked about that everybody signs a clause saying that they can't form an association or a group yeah. yeah. just that might just be mine, like just not knowing, but what, That's like. Great question. So there, there are things called conditions of release, and in most cases, I said everybody kind of flippantly, which may not be the case, but for everyone who I follow in Illinois and Chicago and people who I talk to in, in New York City now, um, for all these folks, there are conditions of release. The, and what's interesting about conditions of release are these are regulations that one must follow. If they're caught in violation of them, they can go back to prison. But these regulations are not codified in any actual law. Like, you can't find a law that says 
for example, it's an, this thing I'm talking about is an association clause. It looks something like um, you cannot associate with known felons or with known offenders, which means when you get out of prison, you can't call your, your celly, your bunky, your rappy, the person you just spent 8, 10, 12 years of your life with, who's likely your best friend at this moment in time. So what does breaking associations do? This means I can't form a class. So I'm treated like a class, but I can't form a class. The entire argument of this, uh, my entire argument is that we've created a new social class. It occupies a unique form of citizenship that's managed by all these laws and policies. Now, here's, that's the barrier, right? But the experience is one where I can't get together as a group based on my treatment in society, right? Not quite, but, 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 but if they're known offenders, for example, I mean, so you might be mandated to a substance abuse treatment program with other folks like that. So that's a mandate. And that's also a contradiction. Um, but I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would hire folks um, for, my, for my research. So I've worked with three formerly incarcerated folks. I'm not saying that for brownie points. I'm saying that as an example. So three formerly incarcerated folks, they did time anywhere from a few years to 44 years was the longest time a guy had served. And I had to talk to each one of their probation officers to allow them to transcribe interviews for me that I, that I conducted with people with records. Right. And then and then the only people who could who could um, do the work of actually conducting the interviews with me or observations or something like that were people who were past their probation. And we know that probation and parole can last four, five, seven, eight, fifteen years. Yeah. Yeah. Great. You. You've given us a lot to think about. As always, Ruben, thank you so much and thank you all very much for joining us.